Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode. Uh, we are reviewing the Silverstone GP. And uh, I like to invite people who attend races because uh, usually when I went to a racetrack, uh, I learn so many things. So once again, I have Jimmy with me. We collaborated a few times. Uh, so for everybody who doesn't know, please introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, guys. Yeah, this is Jimmy. Um, I run the Elbows Down MotoGP podcast with my co-host Alex. And uh, yeah, so we were there this weekend and we've been to Catalonia this year. And this podcast I, uh, we run is um, about almost exactly one year old now. Um, so yeah, I believe that actually. So that's what we, we do. And um, yeah, uh, it's on the up and up, but baby steps, it takes a long time to get to <laughs> to get the traffic coming in on the socials and the, and the players on Spotify, of course. Yeah, it's a process. So uh, regarding Silverstone, uh, first of all, where do you live? How far is it away from the track? So I live 100, 160 miles uh, north of Silverstone, so then in, in York, North England. And Silverstone's in Northamptonshire slash Oxfordshire, isn't it? So yeah, that's uh, three hours in a car. Maybe just under if you, you've got a heavy ride for it. And you're not, st not doing much stopping on the motorway and the services, so... That's where I am. Um, so Donington back in the day was about an hour closer to us. Um, but yeah, it, it, look, when, you, when you're going somewhere you really want to go, three hours in the car with music and friends is nothing, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, I've uh, been in the car for seven hours to go to Most, so it's, it's okay. And um, <laughs> did you stay at a hotel or at a camping site or how did you do it? Stayed at the campsite, so one of the campsites at Silverstone called Woodlands. As uh, Alex always says, that I'm sentimental about that campsite because I've been going for quite a long time. It, it, it's, it's good. Um, facilities are quite good in the campsite. You've got quite a lot of entertainment and food available there. Um, per permanent concrete shower and toilet blocks, which is good. Um, yeah, I like camping if you if, if you can remember everything. Um, so yeah, that's where we what we how we did it, and we've done it for the past three or four years. Um, I think next year, if unless you've got a van or a motorhome, I think it might, it might, I might open the door to an Airbnb or a hotel, but we'll have to cross that bridge. Well, uh, I'm definitely I'm... a hotel guy, so mm -hmm. um, I rarely camp in Austria. I do camping because it's a pain in the ass to get a hotel there. So uh, you uh, was you were at the campsite uh, directly at the track so you could just walk to the track or did you have like a shuttle bus what was the process there well, we, we can walk straight from the woodland campsite um straight to the track and the gate we have um was right behind club corner and vale which is the last two corners so you walk effectively well, as of the last two years into the last section of the track um since they moved to start finish so it's quite nice you can go straight in And you can see them breaking from Vale into Club, the left, the right, that continues, you know, into the start and finish, which is nice. And you can, you know, stand on the grass verge as you, you can, you know, show your QR code as you walk in and hear about the three bikes going around and you get excited. Oh, I'm here, you know, and, and then, you, yeah, it, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice gate to go through, actually. Uh, but it's about a 10, just over 10 minutes walk from our tent, which is fine. And, um, yeah, it's fine if it's not raining. In the past few years, it hasn't rained. On the way to the track so that's okay yeah perfect so what was the experience like so did you enjoy it was there anything uh, that you didn't enjoy and what are like things for people like me who've never attended silverstone that they should know you know i think you've got to be ready for long walks in silverstone it is a gigantic site um which i think is what pisses off lack of a better terminology um people um who go and then say i'm not going again it's a massive site it's uh, it's not the cheapest of grand prix when it comes to food and drink the tickets are if you compare to the you know rest of mainland european grand prix the tickets are actually quite average they're not too expensive so a lot of the brits like to say they are but if you're going you've already committed to going um a lot of people this year more than ever um took push bikes two wheels you know cycling around the track more of that than I've ever seen this year, just to counteract the size of the, the site, the track, um, which gets quite annoying when you're trying to walk. You've got to stop, move, move, and loads of kids on push bikes as well. 
people on electric bikes, people on scooters. I think it's the way forward because it's, it's such a big track. So I'd probably recommend doing that um, because I think it was half and half of people cycling around the track and it was walking. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I mean, in terms of recommend, recommending to people, I would say try and bring your own food if you if you're not willing to spend fourteen pounds on a, a a box of paella or a fish and chips or a burger. Um, it's all around the same. Um, it's expensive food. The, the drinks now, the the beer was the most expensive I've ever seen. It was now seven pounds fifty per pint, um, which is getting on for uh, you know an, a Lon- a London city pint. Uh, in, a, in a good bar, so it is getting very expensive now. Bring your own beer if you like. If, if you like to have beer trackside, not everyone likes to do that. Um, and yeah, get yourself a grandstand because the general admission tickets now for Silverstone, they this year they gave you more access to certain stands with general admission access. But um, the Silverstone spectator marshals are just it's a bit of a lacking communication between which. Which let's say there's an Abbey grandstand, which is turn one. No, you better go to the next one, next one, because that's Abbey South. Okay, you go to the next one. No, no, further down, not this one. Like no, he just said to go this one. No, no, no it's, it's a mess. Um, I think to keep it simple, you should have 130 pounds, and that gets you into whatever grandstand you want. Or 100 pounds, and that's general admission and the terraces. Keep it simple because it, it it's it's a mess. Silverstone do not open all the grandstands. Um, most of the grandstands you probably saw if you watch the races, folks. Obviously, Leo did are empty, and that's because they're closed. They are for Formula One. There is nowhere near enough people there to justify opening them. You would say, so if they did open all these stands, you'd see a couple of people there, a couple of people there in that stand. You know, um, which is frustrating. Um, but yeah, it's it's still a good place to watch. If you watch it certain places, it's still a good place to go. That sounds like I'm being negative, and I actually stick up for Silverstone quite a lot on the socials, if people know. Um, it's it's good value. You're seeing three days of MotoGP for good money. If you're comfortable where you're staying and you stand, you will have a good time, period. Nice. I was wondering about that, what you mentioned with the grandstands, because... I watched it on TV and I was like, nobody's there. What the fuck? Yeah. And you had those races, Germany, Jerez, you know, where Le Mans, we had hundreds of thousands of people and it was packed. And I was wondering, like, why is it empty? And it makes sense now if you don't open the grandstands that they are empty. But it's a bad look for MotoGP on TV because... Like, if you can't fill up the grandstands as the premier motorcycle organization, then you have a big problem. And it's not... Imagine you're a sponsor and you're thinking like, okay, let's sponsor some MotoGP teams. And for some reason, you end up watching the British GP and then you see nobody in the stands. You're like, what it, the fuck It, it doesn't look good for Silverstone or the track. Now, I don't know if this is going to be made out very well, um, but... I know what am I doing? In this picture here, folks, you see a grandstand that was closed and it was for Formula One. Now next to it is people on table and chairs. And last year, though that terrace where people are went all the way where the grandstand is. Okay. And then they put the grandstand there so you couldn't watch there and then didn't open it. So what's the point? It looks ridiculous. Now that grandstand was if you watch the races again, folks, on the last corner. The flip-flop chicane of uh, Vale and Club, you will see a bright blue grandstand with nobody in it because all weekend they did not open it, which just makes no sense. You block it so we people can't sit there with take their chairs and enjoy themselves. Okay, that's that, it's the way of the world. You put a grandstand there, we'll open it, you pay for it, you want to sit there now. But they didn't even open it. So Silverstone, sometimes they don't really help themselves. And obviously, like as you said, as the viewer at home thinks it's, there's nobody there. It looks really bad. Yeah. And what when you compare so which races did you attend already? Catalonia? Catalonia oh, this year, sorry, Catalonia. Yeah, Catalonia. We talked about this one in your podcast. Which uh races did you attend as well? Only Silverstone Catalonia? Uh, I've been obviously been to Herath last year, Magello a uh, couple three times, Magello I've been to now and uh, Bruno, but that was ten years ago, so obviously that's off the calendar now. Um, and if you had to compare those races, where would Silverstone rank? 
I mean, I would probably put Silver Stone in the, low, in the lower spectrum. I would, and which um, if anyone was listening who listens to my Twitter rants defending Silver Stone, it's because it's people compare it to its predecessor Donington Park, which was even worse when it comes to facilities. Now it's all fine and well having a track that's quite short, so you can get it round easy enough. Uh, which like place that Hareth is is short, Donington was short, Silverstone is the absolute opposite. Um, but having a shorter track, you can manage it better and you can get round it more easily. Um, so yeah, I think because of that, it, it and the the weather, the weather doesn't help, does it? Sometimes, but no, I think Silverstone would probably be down the lower spectrum just because there's also there should be some bridges helping people get around from the infield to the out to the outer rim of the track. That's a nightmare for Silverstone. That's why a lot of people were pissed off when they moved it back, the pits back to the wing, you know, the the F1 pits they use now. Yeah. They moved it back there and it's a logistical light nightmare, Leo. You have to go on the Day of Champions, the, the two wheels for life, the charity MotoGP day when you can get in the paddock for four hours. To get there, it's a 35-minute, 40-minute walk from the gate when you're already on site, which is ludicrous. There's no bridge. There could be a bridge that takes you from one side to the other. But they make you go all the way around the infield, all the way around uh, Aintree in the loop and farm curve. Um, so, yeah, all of these things make – yeah, you, you ask me about Hareth or Magello and Bruno and everything. Yeah, these tracks, just for ease, uh, not for, necessarily for racing because the Silverstone races, have, as I've seen, fast tracks make great racing. I've always defended the racing part of Silverstone and the value for the prices. but um, yeah, you can't compare Hareth or Magello to Silverstone. They're um, something else. Yeah, definitely. Well, I uh, attended uh, Germany, and the Sachsen Ring is, in my opinion, the best race I ever attended. It's absolutely amazing there because it's a super small track, and you're right next to the track. It's like five meters, 10 meters max, and then you're at the track, you know? Mm. So. We sat at turn one there, just for clarification. And it's a very, very narrow track, which isn't necessarily good for racing. Silverstone's the opposite. But as a fan, I really enjoyed Germany. And I totally can uh, recommend it, just because of the fact that you're right there, you have proper organization, everything is uh, with a, let's say, a love to detail. And I would honestly prefer a race like this where you have a great experience yeah and maybe not the best racing then have incredible racing but it's a shit experience and therefore the whole level of racing gets yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Down <laughs> because have a balance of, isn't yeah. it really, ideally um yeah I mean, germany I, I, wasn't a bad race it what no what no it's not the last two years have been quite similar haven't they with Martin and Paco going at it if you if you're just looking at one race but yeah I know what you mean it, it um, the Silverstone the facilities are really good that's that's the weird thing the facilities are really good but it's just such a long site and yes you're quite far away um, people go on about Donington just take you back to Donington well actually no because at Donington you just in fact in areas you're even further away I don't know if you remember Leo the crane of curves the first sector of Donington. Um, was really fast and downhill, which is cool because it's, it's it's hilly and everything and quick. But the, the runoff, I remember having to, if you didn't take binoculars to Donington Park, you weren't going to see anything. Um, and yes, there's parts of Silverstone that are the same, but yeah, I mean, I've, see, I've seen, when you watch Saxon Ring, you're right, you know, apart from the, the runoff area um, at the end of a straight, which always has to be a bit longer, doesn't it? Deeper. You are closer to the track. Um, but But... I mean, for the British Grand Prix interest, there's not really anywhere else other than two tracks in this country where it could go. I mean, Brands Hatch would be just as short as Saxon Ring, one of the most legendary World Superbike tracks of all time. But there's just nowhere near enough runoff. No, nowhere near enough runoff for a, you know. It's surprising in some of these tracks we go to that uh, passes the Grade A FIM license. If you ask me, sometimes. Yeah. So, 
for everybody who wants to attend a race, obviously I can recommend Germany, but if you want to go to Italy or if you want to go to Spain, you're having a pretty safe bet that the race, at least from an organization standpoint, is very, very good. And uh, I'm very grateful for your insights about Silverstone because that was always like one track where I thought, okay, maybe I want to go there. I thought about going to Donington, bought Superbike, but with the whole Brexit stuff, I uh, didn't want to didn't want to travel to the UK now because it's much easier to travel inside the European Union. But let's not uh, get political here and talk about the actual MotoGP race. Yeah. <laughs> where Enea basically showed everybody what everybody already knew, you know? Everybody knew if Enea Bastianini is healthy, if he qualifies on the front row, he is almost guaranteed to win the race with a good start you know and he is so incredible on used tires because i have a little fact for you i looked this up because in Bastianini, he set his fastest lap at the beginning of the race it was the third or the fourth uh, lap and uh, it was the fourth lap a 159.0 mm-hmm. and his 17th lap was a 159.17 you know it's ridiculous how incredibly fast he was at the end of the race and this was like the lap where he closed the gap to Jorge Martin he never dropped out of the 159s and everybody else had at least one two minute lap and you you just can't do anything about it if you're Jorge Martin Jorge Martin had an almost perfect race yes he ran wide but this didn't uh, change the outcome of the race, let's be honest. No. Inea would have overtaken him. Yes. It's so amazing how good Inea can ride if he can put everything together. And I really, really hope we can see this further uh, as the season progresses because he's been so inconsistent. But it was refreshing that everybody was reminded mm. on how good Inea Bastianini is. Yeah, I mean, um, I agree 100% there. Best year, we all remember 2022 um how well it how, how great he was well i mean that was a time when the satellite ducati was closer to the sorry a year old ducati was closer to was, was just as close to the current ducati and you know he was able to win four grand prix that year um, maybe so- quick interruption i'm sorry maybe to explain the reason behind it in 2022, Ducati had a terrible engine, the GP22 engine, that um, Jack Miller and Pekka Banyaya back then decided to use the 21 engine. And Inea Bastianini had the 21 engine and the 21 chassis. And uh, Pekko and Jack Miller had the 22 chassis and the 21 engine. Therefore, the bikes were closer together than now where we have the 24 engine, which is better than the 23 engine. And therefore, there's a bigger gap between the GP24s and the GP23s now than back then. Just for clarification, I'm sorry that I interrupted you. That's all right, don't worry. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so you had a better chance to win races, we should say, for those reasons. Um, but it, he was incredible in his second year at saving tires. That's why it was an A. It was so good at that. And um, he's, you're not going to lose that ability. Just last year was a bit of a defunct year almost for an air, simply because he was injured half of it, or most of it. Um, so now he's doing what we all know he can. Um, and it was almost like he could have pulled the pin any time he wanted in that race, but obviously if he did go too early, he, he could be in tired trouble. So yeah, it, regardless of Martin going wide, he was going to win that race, wasn't there, anyway. Um, and it's quite interesting, because he, he, you'd think he's going to be riding a wave of confidence now. And um, if he can start chipping away, I think it's less than 50 points. I believe it's less than 50 points his gap to Martin in championship now. So it could be quite hilarious if uh, he goes to Tech 3 KTM with the number one. But that's, you know, that's uh, let's just to keep fit in the ground. But it would be quite funny when you think of it just briefly. <laughs> yeah, I think Peko still wins the world championship. I think Peko is the best package overall. But Inia definitely has some uh, some races up his sleeve like austria he qualified on pole there for the first time in 2022 then in uh, aragon where he won in 2022 so there are tracks 
Malaysia, where he won last year. Mm -hmm. There are tracks which are coming up where you could definitely make an argument for Niabastini being the favorite. And I definitely think if he sorts out his sorts out his Saturday and can qualify on the front row and can have a good start, then everybody should be in danger. It I don't think it will be enough to beat Paco because Paco is good in the sprint, he's good in the qualifying, he's good in the race. He already has his four crashes, so Paco will only have one crash left for the season to make <laughs> his five crashes a season, which every season he has. So I definitely think Inea will uh, will make it interesting, but I don't view him as a title contender yet. I think it's between Martin and it's between Paco. And regarding what you said about Tech 3, I thought about this today. What prohibits Ducati from just not giving Martin and Inea any upgrades to the GP24 and give them to Paco? Because I don't think that Ducati would want a world champion mm -hmm. going to another manufacturer where the manufacturer, for example, Aprilia or KTM, has the whole marketing advantage of a MotoGP world champion. So I would assume that the updates are for Paco and Mobidelli only and not for not for uh, Enea and Jorge. Same reason why Mark isn't getting any GP3 updates. He's still on the GP23, which they started the season with, not the GP23. Yeah. They ended That's the season right. with. So I think Ducati is managing this in a way that Peko will win the World Championship. Maybe because they got so damn close last year for Martin winning the championship, they're thinking, no, no, no. Yeah. We, we might not get so lucky this year. So we'll see. I'm not sure. 100% I agree with Martin. I think everyone's been saying that, and they're right. There's every chance that Martin won't get any more, any more updates or factory treatment, even though he's on a 24. Um, I'm not sure about Bastianini. Um, it, it would still be, to, even if you know he was to win the championship or challenge for the championship and getting closer, I don't think, in my opinion, they would nerf it because it would still be a factory Ducati winning, winning the championship who just happens, the rider happened to be leaving at the end of the year. Um, yes, I think it wouldn't. It doesn't look right that the number one he takes with him. But surely the are more bothered about the fact that their factory bike won another championship. Um, how bothered are they that it was an air? Um, they'd be probably prefer it if it was Paco, one hundred percent. But you know, I can't see him nerfing his bike um, personally. Uh, that's just my opinion. I'm not Martin saying Martin. nerfing it in a way. I'm just saying not giving him updates. And, but yeah, I don't know I, if you're allowed to give one rider the update and the other inside a team to not give them the update. I don't know if there's a rule for this. So I'm not saying they're making his bike slower. I'm just saying they're making probably... I, I don't know why I said nerfing. <laughs> I don't know why I said nerfing. It's not what I really meant, but yeah, it's a terminology. What, what's to stop the Cassie uh, giving Mark some treatment? What's to stop the Cassie doing that when he's going to be their future rider? So they might as well help him instead of Marty. He's on a year-old bike. We've just seen Ralph Fernandez get a, uh, the 2024 Aprilia. That worked out great. Yeah. <laughs> Give it a chance, Leo. Um, but yeah, I know what you mean. But then, um, is it would, be, would it be financially liable? The Ducati can afford it. Audi money. Uh, for Mark to get a 24 now. But no one's discussed, No one's talking about that, are they? Um, well, why can't that happen? You is can't it, upgrade it the engine, but you could upgrade the aerodynamics and stuff. Yeah. But... I mean, they did it with Enea in 2022. That was another reason they gave him the new chassis uh, as an update. Yeah. He started the season with a different chassis than he ended with. But uh, you mentioned Mark, and Mark is on a disadvantage regarding the bike. Because the GP24 is approximately a quarter of a second faster per lap. Yeah, which is a massive It's huge. Time. Like, on a 20 lap race, that's five seconds. Yeah. And he was overachieving again this weekend because he had some struggles over the past weekends. Like he had his great weekends in Jerez, for example. But um, rides like Germany, rides like uh, Silverstone, uh, where you 
okay, Germany may be different because he's so strong on the track. But like Silverstone, he didn't have a good weekend. He didn't have a good qualifying. He didn't have a good sprint race. And therefore, you, if you put Di Gian Antonio in this, um, in this position, you wouldn't expect him to be fourth. But because it's Mark Marcus, because he's an incredible rider, he extracts the maximum out of the spike. Yeah. But I would like to ask you a question. Do you think Mark has a real shot against Paco on the same bike? Because his season, I don't know if it's because he's new to Ducati and all the data is new to him, or because of the bike, or because maybe it's him as a rider, who knows. Um, he didn't win in Austin, where everybody thought, okay, this is Mark's track. He didn't win in Germany, where everybody thought, hey, this is Mark's yeah. track. He had some good races, he had some bad races, but I don't see Mark Marcus being that extra special like he was in 2019. And I think we can all agree that he's past his prime. I mean, his prime was 2019. He's now not better than he was back then. Which, he's not better himself. Yeah. But the question is, do you think this is enough to beat Peko, who right now should be approaching his prime? I think it's going to be, even though he's going to be on equal treatment, uh, equal equipment and equal treatment, you'd hope, from the team, um, I think it's going to be harder for him to beat Ke Peko than we think it will be. He'll be closer to Peko over race distances. He'll beat Peko, definitely, over times. But Peko has proven how great he is now as a complete rider in a battle. He He really did. He really was so ready to end the race in Hareth, making sure he did not let that move stick. And it was a point. It was a point to prove, and he proved it. He was brilliant. Um, Peko is a, well when he's not crashing in sprints, but that's another conversation. Um, he is the complete package in terms of aggression, mixing that with consistency with the points of the whole year. He's quite happy to take a third here and there. Um, And when he's on form, when he's up front, Mark is going to struggle a bit, not being the same rider he was, because Mark doesn't have this, he just isn't smooth. Uh, it's not his style. Now he's, I mean, when I say smooth, I don't just mean the riding style. I mean, over a whole race distance, he, he, he's, he was never known for incredible tire saving. He didn't need to, because he was usually so far in front back in the old Honda days. But um, the mentality as well with Mark it isn't as uh, smooth as, as, as Peko. It, it's, It's going to be hard because Peko, I think he he might, he, he sounds like he's immune to Marquez mind games. I could be wrong because what he's saying in the media about Mark, you know, the whole, um, you know, towing him uh, in practice and then him getting annoyed because Mark was being towed. Peko getting annoyed, Mark not caring. That's That could be getting into his head. So Mark could try and get away into Peko's head. Um, and if the team say, look, You know we can't do anything about this. Then that could that could that could turn the table. Mark could be in charge then, and Mark could start beating him because he's got into his head. Look, we don't know. I think what we what is definitely for certain is the fact that Mark is not the same rider anymore. So I think they have equal chance of winning the championship. I don't think Mark is going to have the, the massive um, advantage being Mark on the, the latest greatest Ducati. I don't think it'll work like that personally. Um, sounds a bit of a boring thing to say, but I, I, I don't think it will be like that. By the way, I think Peko solved the whole towing thing perfectly with him and the VR46 guys. And I think it was a little bit uh, a bad look for Mark that he complained that he was behind uh, Bizeki and Bizeki wasn't too fast. Yeah, if somebody's in front of you, then it might happen that uh, you're faster. And especially if you're somebody who uh, likes to tow that it goes uh, the wrong way for you every now and then is definitely a possibility and you shouldn't complain then because you chose to be in this position. Yeah, yeah, there's that. So I thought this was a bad look and I think Paco handled it quite well. But uh, I think overall he is right in a sense that uh, this whole towing thing can't continue like this. The Marcus... Uh, Bezeki situation. I don't remember if it was Bezeki or DJ Antonio, where he slotted in behind uh, one of the riders and basically cross uh, crossed the line of the other. 
in qualifying was a little bit dangerous, not too much, but it was a little bit dangerous. And I think they basically need to sort out what they have sorted out in Moto3 already, that you can't be a certain percentage over your sector time um, just waiting for other riders. I think this rule needs to be applied in MotoGP as well. But in general, I think uh, that we definitely need to go away from this Model 3 style qualifying because yeah, it's, goodness it's, me, yeah. not, it's not going in the right direction. I was talking about that over the weekend to my friends and, um, and my, my dad and my uncle were there as well. It needs to stop because one of the for me, one of the main reasons is the well, how it looks to the Model 3 riders. Because if, if at the end of the day, if they're doing it, then the three riders can say, well, they're doing it, and why can't we? It's, it's that simple. It's that simple in a 17, a 17 to 19 to 20 year old mind. It's like, well, I can, they can get away with it. They're not getting penalized for it. So why are we getting along that penalty for doing it when they're not? Um, yeah, it's, it needs to, it, it's always been part of the game now. Mark would argue it's always been part of the game following people. So I don't know how they can police that. I mean, I was sat at Luffield, which is at the end of the Wellington Strait. So you know that. I don't know if you know that corner, the uh, the old last corner, um, before Woodcut Corner, the old start and finish straight. So we watched second Friday afternoon practice, the main practice session to depict Q1 and two placements, and that was the session Mark was getting a toe from Pecco, um, and you can see not just through, not just Mark, but other riders doing it, like some of the Honda riders were doing it. Um, and just just when a rider is on the outside of the corner, letting all the people on the fast laps go through, when they go onto the curb and use more curb just to make sure that no one's hitting them, one of the, one of these days when they're getting out of someone's way, waiting for a tow, it's going to go wrong. They're going to misjudge it, and you're going to get an airplane style crash, and it's it's going to be horrific. And I just don't like this whole waiting for a, a, a disaster crash uh, to happen until until something gets changed. Um, but I mean, it sounds boring. Yeah, towing is part of it. It's always been part of it. Well, yeah, but there comes a point where we're getting quicker in each category and it gets dangerous. I thought it was very, very entertaining to see Alex Marcus and Fabio Di Antonio go at it. But I have one issue with it in a sense that it was totally unnecessary for Alex Marcus to fight DJ the way he did. Yeah. And it's not a criticism of Alex Marcus because he has every right to do so. And if Digia doesn't want to be overtaken, he should ride faster. But I think it's a general uh it's a general problem we're having in MotoGP at the moment that you cannot afford to lose too much time in battling because then Digia's race was ruined, you know? And I can definitely understand every, let's say, rider who refuses to do so and be more tactical about it because it benefits them at the end. But it's not what we want to see as a fan, you know. So, so I uh, definitely, my dog just came home and I need to say hello <laughs> um, yeah and we need to definitely improve on this i hope that the 27 rule set improves on overtaking and stuff that you don't lose too much time there but it was always with overtaking a little bit difficult but i got a feeling that it's that it got a little bit worse over the years so but it was fun you know did he uh really gave it to alex and alex didn't want to didn't want to that back down and therefore gave it to him and all of a sudden it was a two second gap so it was uh it was very very fun to watch and i really enjoyed it it was so cool. i forgot about this uh, what did you think about the whole uh livery situation mm. yeah, did you cool. like it didn't you like it what's your opinion on this uh. okay so i was a little bit disappointed by alej and I was wondering what you think about this, because obviously he won there last year, ran into some uh, 
tire problems. And I believe he said that the Ducatis have something on him or on the Aprilias regarding tire management. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? What's the state of Elege at the moment in MotoGP? The state of Elege, um, I, I don't think... Well, I, I think he's still as good as he was in Catalonia. Um, in, well, in terms of mentality, yeah. I don't think he's... I don't think he's... Well, he got pole position, didn't he? He smashed the circuit record. I mean, that doesn't mean anything for points, obviously. Um, but I do believe that um, he's, he's still got potential to win an, another race if, if the Aprilia can fight it, can fight the 24s anymore. We might have just got to a point, for all we know right now, that nothing can beat the GP 24s. And I think that's just as equal. I mean, it's it, it's easy to assume that um, the likes of even Brad or Pedro or Leish and Maverick are just underperforming. And I think I mean, for KTM, it's more of a, a 2024 Michelin tyre thing for and, and KTM. Um, but with Rapulia, they've got a, a sounder package, you could argue, over the course of the year. I think Leish might be just... Look, he, he might be in the you know just pre-retirement mindset now. Um, but I, I don't think, I don't think he's done. I think he still have another win in, win in him potentially. Um, I just think it's hard. It's everything's a bit distorted now. When it, when the GP twenty fours, all four of them are, well, apart from Morbid, Dali maybe in some tracks. It just it's so good. It d distorts what we can understand about the rest of the field. Um, but um, yeah, I think it is a shame because I actually had a lay down to win the Grand Prix and maybe even the sprint. Uh, I certainly thought he had a better chance in the Grand Prix. Um, you know, because it was actually sprinkling rain. We got a bit, a tiny, tiny bit wet on the knees and the arms. Oh, hello! This reminds me of last year. Um, if it did this in the last, if it does this in the last lap, and Alej is there and he takes more liberties than anyone again, we could be deja vu and Alej could win. So, yeah, I, I, it's it might just it's weird because it's to me it was in the prettier track. They should have won in twenty two with Maverick. He should have beaten Peko in the last lap at Silverstone last year. We know Alej won anyway. Um, so I think it was disappointing for, for Aprilia. I mean, I said that in, in one of my stories on my on the Instagram for our podcast um, that yeah, it was a bit of a shame. Um, but I, in the in the next races, we'll see how how bad it is. Um, but, but as I said, it could be just because the Ducatis are so strong. We don't yeah. know. I mean, with Elias, there was like a pretty big drop, big and after lap twelve, like in lap twelve, he had a one fifty nine point six. And yeah. the next lap was a two uh two zero point one, and it's like half a second he dropped in one lap, and then he never recovered and just got slower, and it was very very weird because in my world Elias is somebody who can manage a tire, he is not somebody like Jack Miller where you expect okay this thing's gonna go, and uh, it was weird because at the beginning he was in a good position yes martina mm -hmm. and peko were in front but then inia made the mistake he was in fourth and therefore aleish was in third with a lot of track in front of him you know and he didn't manage to do anything and then when yeah. inia overtook him he really gapped him yeah so yeah. it was it was weird i expected a lot more uh from aleish he was it was a little bit disappointed And uh, not to speak of Maverick and uh, the Trackhouse guys, because I don't know what they did if Aleish disappointed. So uh, with Maverick, it's the old thing, you know. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was exactly... It, we don't need there. to discuss this for the 200th time. No, it, uh, it was a nice little holiday in the UK for Maverick, wasn't it? Nice little yeah. trip across, nice little cheeky little yeah. top 10. <laughs> <laughs> he is going to lose his mind at KTM. I am guarantee you. Yeah, I can see that happening as well. But yeah, with, that's you just reminded me with, with um, when you touched on Aleish, when he was running in third, I think he was running third. He was running third, wasn't he, at one point in the race. I thought he's in a really good position here. And I still believed at that point he could win the race. And by the way, we didn't really finish the livery thing off. That was the best livery. Just just so everyone knows, in my opinion, that was that was the Chesterfield Aprilia nod the nod to that livery and he even had the yellow max max biagi helmet and the yellow number and the same fonts and so did maverick that was that was a fantastic looking bike good uh lovely, beautiful gloss black lovely. i'm in love with the uh, grizzini i think it's 
It's the best livery. They ran it yeah. in Misano a Did they couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. And I absolutely adore this livery. It's so beautiful. The white with the tricolore. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's I mean, timeless, isn't it? I guess it works. Yeah, it, cool. it's perfect. I would love them to run this full year and because I don't really like the blue. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I stopped caring about the Grisini livery. It's terrible, but it is what it is. So, um, you you mentioned something interesting regarding the GP24s. Yeah. And, yes, Aprilia here and there, they have something, like Maverick won a race and uh, Aleish had a pole and stuff, won a sprint, but KTM is nowhere. And I remember... You and I and Keelan were talking preseason about our predictions, and mm -hmm. my prediction was that Pedro will be the best KTM. And you strongly disagreed back then. And uh, now, even though it's close with Brad Binder, it looks good. But let's talk after the season. But uh, yeah. it's it's absolutely crazy that the rookie is your best rider. It's absolutely crazy. If this is true that they didn't develop the carbon frame for one and a half years now, yeah. and or like one year they introduced it in yeah, Milano, I believe. I, I think I think Pedrosa was the first to race it in Perez, was he not? Or I don't know. I no, don't anyway, but yeah, about a year, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy, and they need to change something on the bike because whatever it is, everybody else is running away with it, and. KTM is now the third best manufacturer with Brad and uh, Pedro fighting for top tens and Augusto and Jack Miller are fighting with Japanese bikes. It's yeah. Yeah. not looking good for KTM. They're on the wrong side of the development curve and I don't know what is going on there. I really hope they've, they've figured something out uh, for Pedro's sake mm. but this ship isn't going in the right direction and I don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's if it's the 24 Michelin front or rear. They have touched on the tires a lot. Um, you can't you can't uh, make a tire that's perfect for every manufacturer. Um, you've got to adapt and design your bike around the tires. So, uh, but then Michelin sometimes change it at the start of the year. So, I hate this subject. It's so boring, but it, you know, tires is such an important and subject that makes all the difference in the end. The tire makes all the difference sometimes. So, uh, the development of the the Ducati has been beautiful around it. And at the start of the year, the KTM's did have a shout. Um, look, uh, they're spending. Are they are they are they not spending less money next year? Uh, KTM for de development. I mean, I've heard they're spending less money on development, and obviously they're pulling out gas, gas. And just renaming it KTM. I think the they lot of their sorry the, the brand in the commercial side of their sales of the bikes and um, made less money. So I think they're they're turning down the motorsport a little bit, but they can't really afford to do that when they need to develop a twenty five bike that can um you know be on top, an onslaught of the Ducatis. So yeah, it, it's I think this year's bust. Um, I can't see them winning a Grand Prix this year. Um, I thought we I, I maybe even struggle to win a sprint now. Probably not because. It looked possible at the start of the year, didn't it? We all thought, oh, Pedro's going to win a sprint. Pedro's going to win a race. And not only did he manage to not beat Mark's youngest uh, winner record, I think he'll probably struggle to win a sprint at all this year. Now, it's 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 hard enough for him to get on the podium now. Almost almost impossible, it feels like, with these Ducatis. More Bidelli getting up to speed. Bastianini always at the front now. Mar Alex Marquez is always there. So it, it, it's really tough now for, to be on a KTM. And it's going to be a lot of focus in different different aspects of the bike in 25, I think. They, they, they can't rely on what they know already. The, the game has moved on again. Um, but, and be, as you know, fighting the Japanese, before we know it, they might be in the same boot as them if they're not careful. The thing with KTM is I don't really know where the state of the bike is because everybody has good riders. Like KTM also has good riders, yes, but um, KTM is the only manufacturer at the moment where you say, okay, I don't really see winning material at the moment. 
Ducati, obviously, they can win every Grand Prix. Aprilia, they can win with Maverick and Aleix. You could make an argument that they are able to win any given Grand Prix as well. With Brad Binder, he won one dry race. It was Brno 2020 and this miracle in Austria. I'm not taking anything away from it, no. but it's not the norm. And Pedro, he's a rookie. He's their best rider. And if a rookie is your best rider, you're usually in trouble. And it's not like a Mark Marcus, Danny Pedro's situation where both are fighting for the world championship. It's they're fighting for P8. And Pedro, just from results, isn't getting better. He's getting worse. But I don't think this is a Pedro problem because usually as a rookie, you understand more and you get better as the season progresses. Yeah. You don't get worse. Exactly. So the logical conclusion for me is that KTM is on its usual track. They started the season strong like they did last year. Then they're in a very difficult position in the middle of the season and probably have some good races towards the end. But this inconsistency they had with the steel frame they can't get rid of with the carbon frame and honestly ktm is such a shit house that i'm very very sorry for pedro that he has to put up with this i mean look at the history of the manufacturer they haven't won a race since austria they haven't won a dry race since catalonia 2021 uh, with, with miguel 2021 What's going on there? Honda has won a race more recently. <laughs> That's crazy when you say it like that, actually. But I mean... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, Mark Marcus won a race more recently. Mizano 21. Yeah. 20, yeah. Yeah. It was the end of the 21 season. Yeah. It, it's one of those things that you say, think, hang on, I must be wrong, but you're not. You know, it's, 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 it's crazy. And I think... Pit Byron must be really, really thinking if we don't if we don't get on with this soon, um, Pedro will Pedro will be soon sniffing out a way out, and they can't afford to lose Pedro. No, they're, gold, they're, they're golden boy. They need uh, they need better riders. I think it was good that they signed Enea. I don't understand why they signed Maverick because this is a recipe for disaster. Yeah, and yep. well, Brad. Yep. You're stuck with him because of the contract, but it's still not it's still not good enough what Brad Binder is doing at the moment. No. Um Brad Yeah, it's not the Brad we saw last year. You could almost you could almost put money on Brad finishing in the top three, couldn't you? It felt like it anyway. It was good in the World Championship last year. Yeah. Yeah, he was always there or thereabouts and um you know, he nearly won a couple of races. Uh Thailand comes to mind it chunks the international circuit that race was a brilliant race and i thought he, if he beats if he beats paco and martin in this race it really just show how good he is and uh, not just the bike but i mean th that sort of performance now this year feels like an eternity way Leo, um compared to last year jesus um but yeah um well i mean what else did you want to speak about performance wise for, for the you know for the for the teams and the bikes in the MotoGP gp races as my well, eyes run out of charge, what's going on? We could anyway. spend another 20 minutes on <laughs> uh, talking about how shit Honda and Yamaha are, but I think we covered this already a thousand times. Yeah. <laughs> and I would love to hear from you uh, about the Model 2 race because Jack Dixon won. It's the only British victory uh, hopes since basically Kirk Crutchlow left. Mm. Was there? And, uh, mm. I mean, Sam Lowe's had one or good, two good races, but yeah, it's yeah, weird no. for me that British motorsport looks so good in the super uh, bike world, yeah, but so bad in the GP world. It is. It's um, it's very strong in the super bike world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, with with Ray, it's 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 declining a bit because obviously he's in the twilight of his career. But you've got Lowe's, and you've had Sykes in the past. Scott Redding, um, and there's more coming. So, um, but yeah, uh, back to back to Jake Dixon. It was brilliant. Um, obviously, look, <laughs> trying to be as impartial as possible. <laughs> um, you know, having a little, little podcast. Um, but last year, in the British Grand Prix, before 
we had a podcast and was with my friends and obviously we were cheering Jake on and we saw him and Darren Binder come together and Jake crashing right in front of us and then Jake got upset and it was a disaster British Grand Prix for him. 12 months on, Jake's had a very shit year, obviously the the KTM team, so yeah, well, the, the peer uh, mobility group going to WP suspension and it's really struggled. And then Jake's had that gigantic crash in LaSalle and got injured, missed a lot of races and then can't get used to suspension like the other ones. And Vietti's taking his time as well. And then obviously got the podium in Catalonia. And then I think because of last year and his current form, no one really thought Jake's going to do anything at his home race. To be, I don't think there was mass expectations, to be honest. Especially then, not with Ayogura on pole. No, no, exactly. With that, with the boss's gear, exactly. You know, it, it's it's so hard to beat right now. And then um, and he did well in qualifying. And thought P6, that's a good that's a good qualifying. It's looking dry. And we know Jake gets in the rhythm and he's so good at looking after the tyre when he's switched on. If he gets past half race distance, he's, he can be lethal, and he was. Um, and I was stood, was stood with my friend Gareth and, and Katie and a few a few people you make friends with who you stood next to. And it gets past half race distance, and he looks like he's he's almost not toying with Canet, but um, he looks so comfortable, like he, he's just going to wait for his moment, just save the tire. And of course, that's what he did. And um, yeah, it was it was a very it was a very nice moment. Um, you know, it was it was a bit emotional almost because um, it just happens very rarely. Last time I saw, I've only seen, a, well, it's actually not a bad start, but I've seen two riders win their home Grand Prix in front of me. And that was Danny Kent in the wet in 2015. And then 2013, we saw Scott Redding win the British Grand Prix Moto2. Um, so the most recent was 15. So nine years ago, basically, the last time we saw it. And yeah, it was, it was nice to see. And obviously, the last lap when he just passed Canet and coming into... The last four corners, the atmosphere was brilliant, and everyone's like, you know, shouting, "Come on, hold on, hold on!" It was, it was a nice moment, a really nice moment, and um, a nice cherry on top of the cake for the weekends as a Brit. Uh, it has to be said. I think, yeah, I think you look at any the few other British podcasts that are more slightly more mainstream, shall we say, would would say similar things. I'm not ashamed to say it. It's a, it's a nice thing, um, and he earned that victory very well. And that move, by the way, the first corner isn't really. You do see some overtakes going into the first corner at Abbey, but it's a very fast one, and it took Aaron by surprise to sit the bike up a little bit. And I think he knew if he did it there, um, he'd have an advantage because Aaron would already be offline having sat up. It was shocking. It's, it's all fine and well going in, you know, doing the easy one under the brakes, but then someone can come straight back underneath you because you're going to drift ever so slightly wide. So it was very clever from Jake. Um, I just hope <laughs> the form can last for him. Uh, but yeah, it, it was nice to see. Uh, it's a shame about Joe Roberts because uh, that could be his hope stash now from LGP, right? Even though he was, that battle he had with uh, Bossy Skira, was it, sorry, Ayagura Garcia? Any, yeah, Ayagura. Um, that was a terrific battle to watch. Really entertaining. Um, none of them, neither of them were giving, giving it an inch. Um, so, yeah, um, the, the, the Calyx is basically, you know, is, is the story of the weekend, being able to really take it to the Bossy Skiras. Yeah, I definitely agree with you that it was phenomenal from Jack Dixon. It was crazy. Uh, I have to be honest, I expected him, A, to do something stupid during the race, and B, I expected him to do something stupid after the race with the post-race interview, talking about how he beat the next Mark Marquez. But uh, honestly, he surprised me positively that uh, he was more or less mature it still was a little bit cringe but it's jack dixon so it's normal i guess and just to judge his uh, on-track performance it was just perfect it was valentino rossi in his prime waiting behind alex barros for the entire race and then in the last <laughs> lap just having an overtake and leaving them no chance i mean it's crazy that aaron Canet has now how many second places 15 <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, I feel sorry for him because he rode yeah. such a brilliant race. But uh, Jake Dixon was just better, and he caught him by surprise. He overtook him, and then just went on with it. And yeah. I'm very, very happy for him. So uh, I was wondering how many people did leave after the MotoGP race. Was it a lot? Uh, there was. I mean, if where we were still, you can see the last corner, the grandstand. And the start finish grandstand, you can see the podium, you can see quite a lot. 
Uh, you could tell a few people had left after the GP race, but most had stayed definitely. Um, for for for, for Jake, really. I mean, I mean, and the fact they paid for it. Um, it's the. I will sorry. This is slightly off subject, but it is so fucking stupid. And Donna have said they'll stop doing this a few years ago and then carried on doing it. That it's the one race of the year where it goes. The race order is Moto Three, Moto GP, then Moto Two. It makes no sense. It's something to do with the TV timings from mainland Europe, which also makes no sense because in Portimao, where we're on the same time frame, obviously time zone is Portimao and Portugal. They don't do it. So why does it happen in the UK? It makes no sense. You should have it the same order, and then when the Moto GP race finishes. Everyone goes onto the track and you've got an atmosphere underneath the podium, how it should be. Um, so then, you know, all that you get guaranteed everyone staying for the lower categories. Um, but yeah, you could tell a few people left in, in short is a short answer, um, but not many. No. I agree with you regarding the organization that it's stupid. And regarding the Moto2 race, I definitely think Sergio Garcia today proved why he should be world champion. Because Fam and Aldegir can't get a proper season together. He's so up and down, he might as well sign with KDM and not with Ducati. <laughs> and Ayogura had the perfect opportunity from Paul to win and really take the championship. Uh, and he failed. Sergio Garcia came from 17th on the grid. Yeah. He was so incredibly fast. And especially after his uh, little incident in the first corner, he was like outside the top 20. It was very difficult. And he almost finished on the podium. Incredibly good. Very, very impressed by his race. Mm. And uh, Joe Roberts ca cannot stay on the bike uh, when it matters the most. Like he He needed to finish this race on the podium and he would have been fine. Now it's a little bit difficult yeah. to make an argument for him as world champion. But uh, because you don't see him going on a five race win streak like you could argue Ferminaldi can because Fermin is that good. And you always have the danger with it. But it was a little weird weekend for Moto2 when Jake Dixon and Aaron Canet are by far the best riders and all the championship contenders have one or two problems more than they usually have. And I think Sergio Garcia managed the whole situation the best. Yeah, Garcia is he's, 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 your, he's your modern equivalent of the upcoming Spanish Moto2 rider <laughs> that does well and wins and is probably going to win the championship. And it's just smart and yeah, smooth and calm and collected. Um, Yeah, I, I, I can't. You, you've said everything that I would have probably said anyway. There, if, if I'm really honest, uh, I will say you, you mentioned Aldegar. Um, this 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 whole Ducati thing is starting to look really silly. Honestly, um, it it looks like a year too early. Frankly, and it could have been a year early. It, it, it could have been this year, which would have definitely been too early. But um, I don't know how this is going to pan out. Really, he's going to be at Rossini. Almost well, almost certainly at Rossini Ducati. If this happens, which it will do, because it will cost Ducati seven figures at least to stop it from happening. And who um, else should you put in there now? Who else should you put in there now? Well, the riders' market is more or less sorted out with riders. I would put, I would put Joe Roberts on it, and uh, I, I would just you know fight the bullet help the American market, help the growth of the sport. He can fight and sometimes you've got to you've got to compromise a little bit of purity for growth of the sport. Which people listening think, Are you serious? I was like, Yeah I am, because at the end of the day, you've got that leaves twenty one of the best riders in the world and Joe Roberts might not quite deserve to be there, but at the end of but He's got. He's better than Darren Binder when Darren Binder went to MotoGP. He's better than Carol Abraham when Carol Abraham went to MotoGP. I could wow. go on. Nicolo Canepa. You know, there's a load of riders that went to MotoGP. The that thing, probably didn't get to deserve it. Yeah, I totally agree with you that Darren Binder didn't deserve his right, and I was fuming back then. <laughs> But it makes total sense if you know the whole story. Darren oh, Binder yeah. was in yeah. Moto2 and Moto3. I'm sorry, riding for. I don't know 
who. And then he, I believe it was the CIP team, but I'm not quite sure. And then he signed with Petronas. Yes. And in 2021, Petronas had a team in Moto3, Moto2, and MotoGP. And basically what he had was a contract with the team. Mm -hmm. And then Petronas pulled out. Right. which left Razlan in a situation that he can only afford his MotoGP team. And then Darren Binder had to be promoted because yeah. he had a contract. And That's it's right. not that Darren Binder was so incredibly good that he deserved to go to MotoGP. It was that Darren Binder just had a contract at the right time or at the wrong time, depending on the perspective. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah. But um, good lawyers, very good lawyers there. Uh, yeah. The Binder family must have uh, had, but yeah, I remember that well. Um, but the point I was making was he was still in MotoGP. That story is very true. Good. He was still there. Um, and, and yeah, yeah, you were saying about yeah, it's 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 frustrating. You were saying, but I don't know. I think I think Roberts deserves to move up, and I think if you have Aldegar go, up, he was going to be a star, he just isn't ready yet. It's too early. Um, I mean, if these rumours about Chantra going to LCR Honda and, and replacing Nakagami are true, because obviously he's part of the Aidametsu Team Asia banner, fine. If he goes up after the season he's having and Roberts doesn't, that's stupid. Um, no. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It, it's it, When you look at it like that, Leo, it, it's it's silly. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just, this is the dilemma you've got and you've had for the past two seasons when Suzuki pull out and you've got two less rides on the grid. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, last last uh, thing I quickly want to mention is uh, Moto Three. Yeah. Once again, it was the best race of the weekend. Yeah. It was absolutely chaotic. I really enjoyed it. Joel Kelso was doing great. Shout out to him. I thought Colin was very very smart about it, uh, keeping uh, his um, he keeping his cool for most part of the race and then attacking at the end, almost pulling it off. Basically, with the same uh, thing David Alonso is doing every time. I mean, it was just a great race. I love Moto3, and uh, I'm very happy that Ivan Otola won because it was his birthday. So, great story. Yeah, Otola was played it cool again, and was, you know, the, the similar sort of form to the Aston race. It reminded me of his Aston performance, uh, frankly. Yeah, he, he looks like a dark horse right now. I uh, thought Alonso was going to have them all again, um, uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> Colin was great. Uh, Col uh, uh, there was a few people around us shouting, "Come on, Col!" Um, so he's got a little British fan base. I liked that. Um, yeah, that was that was nice to see. Um, and Colin, I, I genuinely thought on the last lap, he, he's he's going to have them. He's going to have them here because he had that gap on the last lap. He played it cool towards the back end of the top ten, didn't he? Um, and then pulled the plug, and then he got pipped. Um, but on the well, back on the end of the hangar straight, it's Stowe. He, he he nicked the lead just for a second, and then yeah, he got muscled out the way by those two at the end. But still, nonetheless, brilliant race. Um, Kelso as well did well. I thought um, a Jack Miller esque start. Just oh look, I'm leading for this more time, and then a sort of drift back a bit. Um, but yeah, it's. I mean, it, it was a good race. It's always Moto Three and Silverstone being one of the fastest tracks. You're always going to have the best train. You're always it's almost guaranteed a great race um, for those for, for the track and the bikes there for, for for that category there. Sorry. So yeah, just a shame that um, we did have the best result for Scott Ogden in Germany in for tenth. And the interview we did with him, I never I've never heard him so confident. And then he was. He was like fourth in one of the first practice sessions, and then sixth, I think it was. Well, he was inside the top ten anyway. Uh, just scraped through into Q two, and then the team messed up, or he messed up, and ruined their own qualifying. And then Scott was just chasing the front group, and then Pequeras high sides, and Scott has nowhere to go at all. Goes straight into him, and that was that was that for for those two. Also, um, I can't believe. That there was not more accidents at the you know the chicane Leo before the last corner. Uh, there was so many people running wide there and crashing between Moto Three, Moto Two. We thought there was something on the track. The whole group of people around us, there were we couldn't believe there wasn't oil flags. There was so many people crashing there and going wide. Um, 
but potentially, I think it was just people pushing hard under the brakes trying to pass people. But yeah, there was plenty of that going on in Moto Three. I couldn't keep track of it, especially when the the screen is so far away from us. And even though oh, I've got five G, I'll just stream the race on my phone. It's fine on my iPad. No, all the data is taken up, and I, you sort of have to think: is that who's that? Is that oh yeah? It, oh no, it isn't. Oh, it's Vincente Perez. No, it's Scott. No, it's Perez. Oh. So, yeah, Try watching stuck. a Red Bull Rookies Cup race. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, almost, almost. It was um, it was actually quite hard for the MotoGP with all the liveries, but yeah, that's another conversation. But no, the Moto Three was brilliant, and um, I would I would say I think Ortola can win. He's got potential to win most of the remaining races of the year. You know, potentially, if uh, I mean, unless Alonso starts starts winning all the time again, um, I think Ortola. It's got a lot of momentum behind him now. I mean, Aston wasn't the last race before, obviously. But yeah, we'll have to see. Okay, so I have to go now because I have some stuff to do. I really yeah, appreciate cool. you coming on here. Mm -hmm. And uh, please tell everybody again where to find your podcast and then we will uh, end this one. Yeah, so it's the Elbows Down uh, MotoGP podcast. So we're on Instagram. Uh, not Facebook just yet or YouTube. That's coming in time. When me and Alex get a bit more confident, but uh, yeah, Twitter as well. Um, my my Twitter handle is predominantly used more than the podcast on Twitter, and that's uh, Jimmy GP underscore, and that's with an I E. Uh, but Insta uh, Instagram is where you'll see most of the updates, like stories and whatnot, if I'm at the track. And that is elbows down GP, and that's it. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>